and welcome to Footnotes the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Hannah and I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to Cicerone Live. I'm Hannah. Tonight we're discussing the wild country backpacking in Scotland and the highlands and islands of Scotland are home to the most ruggedly beautiful, expansive and challenging backpacking country. We've got David and Stefan, who are two of the authors of the book, and they're going to be doing a little presentation for us and really getting into why you should go to Scotland backpacking, what the concept of wild country means to them, and of course, answering as many of your questions as we can possibly fit in. So just a little bit about the book. First of all, it's available soon from Cicerone Press. If you go to cicerone.co.uk, you can pre-order that now. And it's the sort of coffee table style inspirational book and it's absolutely beautiful we'll talk a little bit about whether it's a guidebook or not as well in this session it really is absolutely beautiful so yeah i'd get your hands on a copy of that so as i said we've got david and stefan here with us tonight david is from south london originally but got introduced to the outdoors as scout he's also very keen on photography and they are lucky enough now to live in the cairngorms which is, yeah, fab, well escaped uh, from the down south, I say. Stefan spent a, a long time backpacking at a young age in the Cairngorms as well. He's explored the Scottish hills pretty thoroughly. Peter Edwards is the other author of the book, and sadly he can't join us. He's our Hebrides expert, and he's got a book specifically to the Hebrides, as well as being part of this project as well. So, yeah, sadly he can't join us. But just to acknowledge that it, this book wouldn't be this book without him being involved as well. So, hi David and hi Stefan. Evening. Hello. So, should we go straight into the uh, presentation? Well, yeah, well, f- first, just to say it's been a real pleasure to work on this book and it's even more exciting to know that there's actually people who are interested in it as well. So I hope we can kind of pique your interest further uh, this evening. I was going to say a bit about the authors. I think Hannah's kind of introduced us all. It's actually the first guidebook that I've worked on. David has done one other guidebook for Cicerone, the Big Rounds, which is on uh, the kind of big fell running rounds um, in Wales, Scotland and England, um, which you may be aware of. So it's been really good having three authors involved, actually, because I think just the scale of this project and the fact that we've covered islands and, uh, you know, coastal areas, um, you you know, quite far and wide across uh, the north and west of Scotland. Um, So cumulatively, it's been an enormous amount of time um, to pull all to explore and research and um, walk all these routes um, and pull it all together. So it has been uh, an interesting experience, a good experience, and and, and kind of really, uh, you know, I, I don't, it'd be quite a lot for one person to take on, I think. So it's been good. It has been a good experience working together on this. The original idea, I think, was Pete's initial thought to kind of work on a, a backpacking book uh, or a book specifically about backpacking um, in the Highlands and specifically looking at kind of the wilder areas, mainly in kind of the north and the west and the islands, and uh, and also some of the areas around the Cairngorms as well. David and I came on board really quickly when this, you know, as I say, due to the kind of the scale of it became apparent, and we kind of um, worked up the idea uh, between us um, uh, and started kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, pulling together the idea for kind of, diff- you know, what routes we could uh, we, we could include in this. So we've each kind of brought our own things to, I guess. I mean, Pete, uh, you know, Pete's based out in the Hebrides and he's very much a kind of expert on the, the islands. He's, he's um, authored a, a guidebook uh, on the Hebrides to, uh, for Cicerone, um, which uh, I think is, is one of Cicerone's kind of favourite titles. You know, he's, he's very kind of well-versed in the kind of coasts uh, and the islands. And, uh, you know, David, David and I are perhaps... Um, you, you know, more of a focus on the mainland and, and uh, uh, summits and ridges and things like that. And uh, so it's been good to kind of get that mix across the different landscapes. Um, David's also pretty well known for his photography and there's loads of his photography in, in the book, which is just absolutely stunning when you, when you see it. Um, just fantastic um, photography in the book. David's also quite knowledgeable and has written quite a lot about some of the cultural aspects of the Highlands as, as well. And, and that, that kind of really comes through in, in, in the book as well. Um, 
Uh, as myself, I've, uh, you know, I've got quite a keen interest on, on the historical aspects, some of the old um, routes and paths crisscrossing the highlands um, and uh, the kind of the, the geology, the kind of deep time aspects as well. Um, so we've each got our own kind of special areas, but, but we'll, we've overlap, we overlap quite a lot as well. So I guess the concept, you know, what, what kind of makes this book different and, and special? Why should you kind of um, take an interest in this book? One thing about Scotland, and if you've, if, if you've been in the Highlands, I'm sure you know it, is it's, you know, Scotland's obviously a small country, but the Highlands um, is kind of, uh, it's kind of like the TARDIS in a way, you know, there is, there's, um, there, there is so much hill country and open space. And, and I think the nature of the West Coast as well, that kind of really heavily indented coastline all the way up the West in the islands means that um, you can really lose yourself up there. There's there's a lifetime's worth of exploring up in the Highlands. I mean, I've I've been going up going for years, and you know, still have a list as long as both arms of places to kind of visit and explore. So uh, it's quite a unique place in the UK, and and I think you, you can see when you go up into the Highlands, the kind of draw it has for people from abroad, from across Europe as well. Um, so it's a very special place, really. Uh, I think you, you know Munro's the, the kind of hill bagging aspects of Scotland. You know Mon Munro's and Corbett's that's pretty well established and well known. And there's a lot of um, you know the guidebooks that are there's a lot of guidebooks um, around hill bagging, Munro bagging, and so forth. So that's very, very well covered. And these guidebooks are kind of focused largely on, on day trips. Um, and a lot of these routes are kind of, you know, you've got your kind of honeypot routes that are very popular and very well covered. But I think what we were kind of seeing was, you know, from our experiences that this kind of, uh, there's so much more kind of off the beaten track as, as well. I mean, there is such a huge amount of ground uh, in the highlands, um, so many glens, old tracks, mountain passes, as the islands, as the coastlines. There's vast amounts of incredible country. Um, and there's a lot more, you, you know, if you're, you, you can kind of explore that, you know, we wanted to show how you could explore that. And also if bagging summits is your thing, we've got a lot of kind of summits and hills in, 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 in it as well. And um, looking at ways that you can combine them in different ways um, and uh, find new ways up hills and linking different mountains together. Um, uh, I, and I think we just wanted to kind of really bring that out. That there is a place where you can kind of let your imagination um, really take over in, in, in planning your routes, um, and it's a perfect place for backpacking as well. Um, I think the other thing to mention as well uh, that, that really makes Scotland quite unique is, is uh, the, the access and camping. You know, legislation around access and camping that we have that we've got. You know, we had the Land Reform Act and. Uh, Scotland in 2003, and that's really it's established like, effectively a kind of a right to roam um, in in Scotland. So there is that freedom to you, you know obviously within within sensible limits. I mean, this is Scottish Outdoors Access Code, which I'd advise anyone who's uh, new to Scotland to kind of take a look at that um, about how how it kind of works in practice. But really. You know, we have that freedom to explore, um, to camp. You're not kind of restricted in the way that you are in, in, in some of the other um, hilly areas uh, of, of the UK. So it really is, you know, the, 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 it's your oyster, really. You, you can you can explore far and wide. As I say, there's, there's so much kind of open ground as well. Um, the, other, the other thing that I think really struck a chord is people may be aware of the Cape Wrath Trail, which has seemed to have grown in popularity in recent years. And that's kind of unwaymarked kind of route between Fort William and Cape Wrath up the west coast and um, it's it's unwaymarked it's a notional route there's lots of variations you can find your way along there and and I think that you know that that kind of uh, has really sort of begun to kind of just open up some of the possibilities but obviously that's a big commitment doing the Cape Wrath Trail but uh, you know what we have in this book are almost like ways that you can have that experience within you know sort of shorter uh, long you know periods long weekends um, and overnight trips and things like that so we really hope that you'll kind of enjoy the routes in this book and, and you'll be inspired to sort of push the boundaries and in, in planning your own routes and, and it'll really kind of fire your imagination as well. Just also, I don't really see myself as a gear expert. Maybe I don't maybe David had have more to say or be able to answer questions in this, but you know, lightweight backpacking has come on a long way in recent years and multi-day trips are a lot less daunting now because there is such a good selection of, of uh, lightweight gear but both David and I are tarp aficionados so um, we enjoy sleeping under tarps and using bivy bags and that kind of thing as well so all that has kind of made it just you know, much easier to kind of get around and you're not carrying huge weight in your back as well and that's really kind of drawn me into backpacking more and more I think too 
what else to say about the routes? I, I think David will probably say a bit more about uh, some of the examples of the routes we've got. But I think generally to say that um, all of the routes that this, each of the routes that we've selected, um, they've got a kind of a twist to them. We're visiting kind of either less well visited places or we're going to maybe including better known summits or kind of classic kind of destinations, but kind of linking them up or approaching them in unusual ways. So we might have a kind of a, a, a twist, you know, some something of special geological interest. For example, one of our routes involves taking in the Alnac Gorge in the Cairngorms, which is Britain's uh, biggest and longest uh, glacial meltwater channel. It's a really fascinating place. Um, we've got old uh, paths, little used stalkers paths. We've got um, ridges which see very little footfall as well, um, linking up um, uh, summits um, from kind of unfamiliar or lesser known ridges. All, all kinds of little twists on, on our routes. And also, again, something maybe uh, we could touch on further later on, I think, but just in the title of the book, we talk about wild country rather than wilderness. And that's a kind of really important point for us to summarise really what we're getting at here is that we were really keen to acknowledge in the book that Scotland's got, you know, the Highlands have got a long turbulent history. There's, um, we may think of it as an empty place, but there's been people living there, you know, for a very long time. And we really wanted to acknowledge that, you know, we talk about wild country rather than wilderness as, 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 as such, you know. But I think that's kind of covered what I want to say. So I don't know if you wanted to um, take over, David, and say say a bit more about some of the routes in the book. Yeah, thanks, thanks Steph. That was great. Um, 30 routes in the book, um, if you like, the guide part, part of the book. 30 routes um, from Jura in the south to Cape Wrath in the north and right out there on the in the Hebs out where out where Pete lives. Yeah, a world, uh, several worlds more to, to, to go at, but that, you know, there's only so much you can do in a, in a, in a, in a single volume. So, um, but hopefully uh, as well, that kind of gives, there's a certain amount of play um, in the book in the sense that you can kind of go where the weather's good um, here. Um, and, and I think as well, the, the breadth, I like Steph, really feel strongly that it's, it's such a, it became such a better project because there were three people on it. It's certainly, yeah, some of the routes, you know, I'm, I'm really excited by the routes that I'm reading that from the other guys that, that, that you know, it's, oh, wow, look, look at that. That's a, that's a great, a great option or that's, a, that's an exciting way to do that, that uh, you know, that area or whatever. So, and I think as well, the diversity really, it's, it may have impacted on, on ultimately on, on the design of the, of the project, but I'll, I might come back to that later on. And I guess the first question for me is, you know, why bother? Why bother carting all your gear all the way up these hills and all the way around them? Um, and, and I guess the answer quite quickly for me is um, you just find yourself, you can get yourself into some amazing places. And you're quite often in these places at very special times of the day and night. And I think as well, the other part of it that's really important is a backpack is a continuous journey. And, and that's really, that's certainly really important for me. And I think, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. I think it's important for the, everyone who works on the project. And, and, and you understand, you, immer, you know, it's an immersive journey and you understand, we hope to understand the place that we visit, places that we visit and better as a result of that continuous immersive journey. So that's um, yeah. It, it, you don't you don't get the same experience just by visiting tops. Um, it's not to devalue that experience. That's that's a valuable experience too, and I certainly have done a, a, a great amount of that. But it's a different. It's qualitatively different. Um, and uh, you know that's obviously the hope is that that comes across in 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 the project and the book. It was important to I think all of us um, to have some uh, to to visit some to include some natural history um, and there uh, you know the. That, you know, I'm sure many of the uh, listeners, viewers will, will know that um, the, the forests and the woods in Glen Affric itself are, are well worth showcasing. You know, this is a spectacular place and, and you know, um, it's, it's worth kind of including as much of that as possible where, where it's where it's sort of um, appropriate to do so. And then there's even some land art on the way, actually, and some of Pete's, Pete's roots uh, kind of reference. Uh, some, of the, some of the kind of more cultural side of things and it's just a spectacular place and it's also a landscape that's been you know has changed and has been changed by by human beings um over thousands of years and certainly you know over the last few hundred um quite dramatically it's you know it's lost a lot of its tree cover and now the tree cover's coming back in um and that cultural aspect as, as stefan mentioned is really you know it's really important um to to make mention of i think you know there is 
there is a sort of a wilderness myth about the highlands you know if it's a wilderness without people i think we have to sort of you know that's perhaps a slightly old-fashioned view now and i think you know anthropology and history and um, geography and sociology are all sort of coming together and maybe acknowledging that that you know that wilderness myth is it wasn't accurate you know you can access these spectacular heights these this of the summits the traditional kind of hillbaggers terrain um, but you do it in a in a way that perhaps introduces some kind of cultural, some historical um, context. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, just you know, world class landscapes. You know, that's that's the thing. You know, it's it's perhaps you know easy to get inured to them by seeing so many pictures. But um, uh, you know, we do have spectacular places. We're lucky to have these places here. So yeah, just just to mention as well that of course, apart from all our kind of um, uh, ridiculous fantasy, sort of like fantasy island route, uh, routes, so hill bagging really, uh, an excuse to do some of that. There, there is of course some practical information in the book, um, in the introduction. There's quite a lengthy cha- introductory chapter or chapters um, that of course kind of you know contain hopefully some useful uh, pointers to you know wild camping and and subject dear to our hearts when we're away uh, which is food um whatever we whatever we do um it always you know um an army marches on its stomach and um and things like you know river crossings and and uh, and bugs particularly sort of yeah particularly uh, buggy afternoon evening uh, uh, to show and then i'll just round up very quickly um just by coming back to that point about the format of the book so as hannah mentioned in the very beginning of the um talk um We've ended up with something that's slightly larger than, than a, if you like, a traditional kind of what I kind of think of as like sort of a wee brick, um, the kind of the, the small guidebooks that um, Cicerone is so well known for. You know, it wasn't always the case that we were going to end up with this. That was sort of a, you know the process involved. Um, and I think we're, we're, one of the one of the things, obviously, from you know, it's nice to showcase the, the photos just a little bit bigger, and, and hopefully that will um, inspire um, and, um, and be be nice to look at. But also, we realised, I guess, that some of the routes, you know, some of the routes are quite off well some of the set parts of the route are quite off piste and so it would be it's useful to have the maps just at a bigger scale or at least to have them you know easier to read. Um and so we you know we, we ended up with a, a book that's slightly bigger um and you know with the idea that perhaps people wouldn't necessarily always be taking the whole book on you know for every route but they they might have it on the car dashboard or they might have it in the bunkhouse or in the hotel or the B and B and it would be and it would then allow folk to Either dip in and out if they live in local in Scotland and and they can you know they're trying to fit these trips in between you know life commitments or if they you know if people are coming up for a a trip for one or two weeks or maybe even more um, from further afield then they can bring the book with them excuse me and then effectively go where the go where the weather is and 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 they effectively you can almost do your planning on the hoof then and and so hopefully we've ended up with something that's that's um, you know nice to look at and is inspiring, but then you know it is a good toolkit. That's you know that's the that's really the the holy grail. You know you've got something you know, that, that ticks all, all of those boxes um, ideally. So so um, yeah, hopefully we've, that's what we've ended up with. Uh, it's, it's up to up to you, the, the reader, to to get past final judgment. And and with that, I will uh, stop yakking. Okay. You can tell that you're both so passionate about backpacking and about Scotland um, and it is often the way uh, that people do get a little bit carried away. Um, So we will go to our questions really, really quickly. Can you just define what backpacking is and what skills and experience you need to go and do some of the routes in this book? Backpacking, uh, it's uh, walking from after breakfast until about tea time. And sometimes if you get <laughs> timings wrong, a bit longer than that. And taking everything that you need or most of the things that you need uh, with you um, to, to keep you comfortable and keep you safe um, for a day out, out, a day out and a night out. Um, and, and, then, and then hopefully doing the same again the next day for as long as humanly possible yeah and we we had a question actually from jonathan and he was asking about um public transport routes um or that he wants to kind of enjoy some of these routes without using the car and one thing that i've picked up on from the book is actually that you are accessing places that you can't get to in a car so they're by their nature they are car free um because you might be able to drive to the start but then you've got to you've got to walk to access some of these places and that's part of the beauty of it yeah that, that is true to a point i think where i think wherever we can access by public transport we have signposted that i can think of one or two routes in particular that, that, that you know where where that's been done 
to IE, you know, where, where you can take a train. There's a couple of routes. Actually, the, the route that Steph was just talking about at the end there, you could definitely take the train to the start of that. So, um, and, and, what, and another one of the routes that um, in the Cuban forest, you could, you, you know. That. So it's true to a point. Um, uh, there are, of course, wider pressures, you know. So um, Scotland's public transport infrastructure is, is suffered, has suffered in the same way as the UK's transport infrastructure has suffered to a point. It's um it's hard to square all those circles within the I guess within the province of a of a guidebook, but where where you can use public transport, uh, I'm, 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 I can say that we've we've done that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean car sharing as well. We did a lot of car sharing. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's I mean yeah. I mean so so Steph's in Edinburgh. I I'm in the King Gorm, So so we'll we'll relay that. You know. So if we do a trip mm. together, and 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 sometimes there's a third person with us, Nick, as we mentioned. So and and you know they'll pull their car. To at Perth or somewhere, and then and then I you know I do the next uh, the next stints up north. So yeah, car sharing is a really good thing. I'm pretty sure there's I mean things like Facebook groups are really useful for that. Um, you know, social media is useful for for that, and I know that I've, I've I see that I see that happen. I see that work. One thing that is really nice about the three authors on this book is that you're not just interested in hill bagging, even though there is a little bit of that, you're not just interested in getting the miles in or, you know, just taking the pictures. You've got a real connection to the landscape and in quite a holistic way, you know, taking the photos, but also being part of the landscape and caring about your impact on the landscape. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I I mean, I think um, when you spend a long time, well, not even a long time, but if you go to some a lot of these places, you you begin to notice things. You notice the, you know, there's a lot of ruined villages and shealings um, in the glens. You know, it becomes quite obvious that there's a a whole kind of uh, culture there that's not there anymore. You know, it's almost like how deep do you want to go into the history? I mean, there's a there's some very old kind of hill tracks um, crossing the country. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've heard it said. I don't know. It's one of these kind of internet cliches, but you know, it's quite often heard it said that Scotland's the most, Scotland's the most haunted country in the world. You know, um, and there's kind of a lot of um, there's a lot of history and a lot of things have happened in in the Highlands. And you, you know, I hope it doesn't sound too kind of airy fairy, but there is a definite atmosphere about the place, and and you do notice, you, you know, as you get tuned in and you, you you kind of spend a lot of time in the peace and quiet um, in some of these these places. They have an atmosphere and. There are uh, a lot of traces um, of uh, from the past, and I think I think um, you, you know when you slow down a bit, you really kind of start to to notice these things, and it kind of grows on you a bit. Um, and I, I think I'll probably speak for David as well. We've um, inevitably, uh, you know, uh, we've developed a, a kind of a curiosity and an interest in, in kind of the big the bigger picture, if you like, you know. Um, from spending time up uh, up north in the Highlands. Yeah, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly with all of that. Um, from a more practical point of view, um, in terms of impact, then you know, absolutely, like you know, you you you're in a place that where, yeah, perhaps you're becoming more aware that the ecosystem isn't quite you know as it sh- could be or as it should be in some cases, as Stefan pointed out with his you know his that shot of the island. Um, and you, you know, that's like, well, you, know, you, come, you might come away the first time thinking, well, why is that? You know, I'm, I'm curious. You know, and then you, you know, do some, do some reading, and, and, and maybe see some more places that uh, look different or that have the same, you know, and then you end up with the same, uh, the same uh, conclusions. And, 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 and so, yeah, the, that, that curiosity that's born out of walking and engaging in a sort of, you know, physical and mentally, um, then. Um, you know, it, it does lead you to start to ask questions. And it also means that when you are out there, you know, you don't want to leave a trace. You know, you I, I want to be invisible effectively. You know, I, st- I still like my red tent, but um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that looks good in the photos. But um, that's so vain. Um, but, um, yeah, you effectively, you don't want there to be any trace of, of, of your passing. You certainly don't want to be leaving any rubbish and, and um and you do, you know, you do end up thinking a lot more about, or I, I have ended up thinking a lot more about that. So, yeah. I feel like it must be even more jarring if you went somewhere like that that was so remote and there was there was some rubbish there. I think that, yeah, it's obviously it's not a great thing to do, but I think sometimes you can become slightly more blinded to it. But if you, you know, if you're backpacking there and there's there's nothing, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I guess it's, yeah, I mean, you do, you know, the litter and rubbish, but I think, I, I suppose, I don't know how political you want to get, but there's also the kind of the larger scale vandalism, I suppose, of how the, the you know, the place is managed. Um, and then, 
I, I think you know the, you get into whole questions about uh, who actually owns this and what are they doing with it and whose benefit is it for and that kind of thing and why is the you know, in some places, why is the ecosystem the way it is and why is it denuded and so forth, you know? So, um, yeah, you do start to notice these things, yeah. Yeah, sadly, we don't have enough time to get into the politics of uh, land management. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> Which is <laughs> it's probably a good a good thing for us all. Um, but you're right, it is fascinating. And I think when you do spend time out walking or cycling or whatever activity you're into, I think it's it's impossible really not to get a curiosity about what's around you and, and what's happening to the places that you love. Um, and you do explore that a little bit in the book as well, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing is that it's, this is, you know, it's it's great, uh, it's a physical uh, activity is, is really, it's good for good for the soul, isn't it? It's good for the body, it's good for the soul. And, 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 and but also it's, yeah, it's, it's good for the mind as well, because, you know, inevitably you end up kind of, Kind of going why is that why is that that thing like that thing is you know it's and and, and that's that's a healthy thing it's, it's healthy to ask questions and, and, and then to try and figure out some of the answers even if we if, even if we get it wrong sometimes so yeah yeah so from that slightly philosophical um level coming down to something the nitty-gritty as it were jackie has asked the inevitable question about ticks um how much of a problem are ticks she said she's always wanted to backpack the Cape Wrath Trail. Um, she's really happy with the challenges of the difficult terrain and the bad weather, but she's put off by ticks. How much of the, the problem is these tick-borne viruses in Scotland compared to other places in Britain? What would you say, Steph? Uh, well, I wouldn't want to say you're not going to get bitten by a tick because I've had a lot of ticks, but, um, you know, it's... it's uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to kind of. You know, it's. Not, I, I guess the big worry is Lyme's Lyme disease, isn't it? Um, and and it's. Uh, it's only a minority of ticks actually carry that virus. I'm not going to put a figure on that. I can't remember. But you're pretty unlikely to come across a tick that has Lyme disease. Although of course there is a risk, and you should be aware of. Um, you, you know, if, if what what kind of problematic bite kind of might look like in terms of a rash and that that kind of thing. So yeah, by all means, educate yourself. Carry a tick twister or one of those tick removal devices. If you're not confident getting it out yourself, get someone else to do it for you, you know, um, to make sure you get the tick out cleanly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a problem, but it definitely shouldn't put you off. Absolutely not, you know. The other thing, sorry to interject, the other thing to carry yeah. if you're going on your own is um, have, have a little wee mirror. Um, carry a little, mm. uh, like a vanity mirror or something, because there's obviously ticks can sometimes attach themselves in places that aren't easily, uh, you can't easily see on your own, or that you might be um, feeling too modest to show to somebody else, and that's totally um, mm. fine and, and understandable. And, and so, yeah, if you have a little mirror, and um, sometimes they have these like little credit card ones, I think, yeah, so... Um, uh, or yeah. a little kind of you know makeup mirror or something, and um, and that and that can be a useful kind of yeah definitely that with a tick twist or a pair of tweezers and and just you know because the deer population has increased so dramatically over the last few decades then yes there are probably more ticks now than anecdotally I'd say there are more ticks now than there were but some people as well seem more susceptible than others so I'd seem a bit less susceptible but I know that my my partner my other half is you know she's a tick magnet so um so perhaps that's why I don't get so many when we're out together but um but yeah definitely I'd, I'd definitely go up you know get get educated get the two tools get the mirror and get the tick twister or pair of tweezers or whatever however you want to deal with them and then just go anyway you know just do it and and and, and, and then just check yourself you know every night you know if you're out on the back yeah I think I think um uh, to be honest uh midges although they're not kind of harmful are probably more of a worry and, and you do actually have you know we joke about midges but we really do have to take them seriously uh, it can absolutely ruin a trip so um uh, particularly you know getting in uh, beyond may i would say to be on the safe side always carry a head net with you um if you're camping ditch the bivy bag and get one of those if you're using a tarp you'll get one of those mesh inners for your tarp um if you're using a tarp um, and have all the kind of the mid repellents and you can get mosquito coils and things like that because um, it's it, it really is no joke and I, I've actually literally been reduced to tears um, by, by them before um, so uh, yeah I, I would be more worried about those than ticks personally. But. Yeah I've had that experience where I've just yeah. I've been driven pretty insane and and stopped stopped finding it funny after a point that they were just biting everywhere and so sort of, yeah. I remember one time just like tearing my hat off and throwing it on the ground and getting in a right strop so 
yeah and one comment actually i had about, about the ticks was if it's if it's decent weather actually wearing shorts is quite good because you can see the ticks on your leg before they bite um so if it's if it's okay weather you can sort of glance down and then if there are any just brush them off i, I guess it's one of these things that it's there's a there's a risk of these things and all you can do is, is mm -hmm. minimize manage it yeah manage the risk yeah yeah, yeah. And, and you know yeah, it's it's in a way, you know, um, you know, I mean, it's a, it sounds flippant to say, but you know, crossing the road is is probably um, technically far more statistic, you're far more statistically likely to get uh, injured crossing the road than you are to get Lyme's disease and um, or get hurt whilst um, backpacking, providing you're kind of sensible and and you kind of manage your um, expectations and manage your ambitions and and you know just add on a little bit more of that excitement each trip you as you go and, and, and so on. So. Is, there, is there anything that um, that puts off ticks, any of these creams or anything that acts as a repellent? I'm not sure that whether smidge does any anything. I think if, I think if they're gonna, I think they, if, I mean, I might be wrong. So I, I heard that um, there's a there's a, a treatment um, that I'm not going to try and pronounce, but it begins with a P. That sometimes clothes are, um, are treated with. They're kind of in, in uh, kind of there's almost like a washing treatment. Is that um, permethrin? permethrin? Yeah, that, that, uh, I think yeah. it's all on those lines. So that might yeah. help deter them. Yeah. Um, you can get clothes. I've seen Crag Hopper, I think, advertising them yeah. clothes that are supposedly repel uh, biting insects and bugs. Mm. Um, so yeah it would be a shame i think i think is the consensus it'd be a shame if that put you off jackie um yeah the cape wrath trail is is challenging but wow what a reward for for those who take it on i hope you do do it and i and i hope for our sakes as much as yours you you do it and you don't get a tick um and you don't get lyme disease because that would that would backfire somewhat on our our advice <laughs> so yeah thank you for that other questions so this guidebook it's not for beginners is it so how experienced do you need to be for this guidebook and um, can you recommend any places that you could go if you are a beginner and you want to get into backpacking um, so how experienced do you need to be i think that there are some routes in here that um uh, are probably more suitable uh, you know i guess uh, more at that introductory end so you know there are some some, some of the perhaps some of the, the three routes i'm thinking of one of, of stefan's actually that kind of the uh, it's not that it to say that it's a simple or, or you know or to undersell it, but there's there's a Cairngorms route that perhaps sort of doesn't necessarily go over so many of the tops. I'm, I'm wondering whether that might be a bit more suitable. I'm also thinking of another another one of um, mine. There's a, a, a couple of Corbett's. Um, one is called Streep, and yet whilst we do it in winter, um, you know that would perhaps be a slightly easier proposition and a shorter proposition in in summer. One of the things that perhaps yeah on on, on you know. It, it's um, it's uh, what, what I, I don't think this book is necessarily for complete beginners, but I think it might give people some. I hope it gives people some something to kind of perhaps to aim for. Um, and it might not be that they aim for all of the routes in one go because we did. You know, it took us. It's taken us several years to do. You know, these. But um, but hopefully it gives people something to kind of. Um, to, I mean, I you know I, I'm aspiring to do some of the routes in the book. So 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 some of the routes that Stefan or and that Pete did. So you know they they they, they excite me. So so that so that's um I don't know if that answers. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer to the first part of the question. The second part, um, in terms of resources, um, I would, I'm I'm a little wary of. I mean, it's. I think social media for some things is fantastic. I think it can be really, it can be a good thing and when it's done supportively, but there's an awful lot of folk, uh, an awful lot of forums, especially kind of Facebook, it seems that um, where the tendency is for it to end up in a bit of a, you're not doing it right, a bit finger waggy. Um, and there, you know, I can say hand on heart, I have made so many mistakes and, um, you know, luckily they've uh, I've lived to tell the tale, and um, I guess perhaps I haven't made mistakes at the sort of at the risky end of my uh, learning curve. But you know, and perhaps that's the key is to start small and, and work up. So be a little bit cautious about advice sought on the internet. If I was getting going to get any gear advice, I'm a little bit biased because I do work and do some gear reviews for magazines. But I would say go to you know get some expert advice from people 
you know, people who've been doing this stuff for a long time, you know, and, and who've got effectively have got no vested interest. You know, you, you know, if you if you magazine review, you, you, there's an editorial red line around that stuff. You're not allowed to to um, you know to you know you, you, we're not sponsored. So um, so you know, you take take an impartial advice and take advice from people who who you who hopefully you can trust. And and that and then the third thing is um, courses. You know, say this again and again and again. The money I've spent on courses has been the best money I've spent in the outdoors, like hands down, like without a doubt. So it's kept me safe and it's made me more confident. Whether it be like a winter skills course or a paddling course or a scrambling course or a navigation course, and I've taken all of those. Um, and they're also really great ways of meeting people, like-minded people, um, who you know share your passion and your interest. And in fact, you know. It, you know, uh, the third, if you like, the, the third man, apart from Pete, who on this project, who, you know, we, I mentioned before, Mick, quite, you know, I met Mick through a, a, a MC of S, a Mountaineer of Scotland scrambling course. And then, um, so, and, and, you know, now Mick and Steph and I do trips together, you know, fairly often, not as often as we'd like, but, you know, so, so a great way of meeting people. And, and again, just getting that like bona fide, bona fide knowledge you know people have been doing this stuff for like their whole lives you know and you just you know they just exude exude uh, there's no bravado you know and so that, that all of that kind of all of that sort of and um, some of the silliness that we see on social media kind of is stripped away and, and people don't have anything to prove and it's just like yeah brilliant you're here we love that you're here let's find out how we can just you know we're gonna we're gonna have fun but we're gonna learn and that's yeah so courses 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 go on a course not money it may, it may be expensive, but let's face it, it's probably going to be about a third of the cost of a waterproof coat, isn't it? Let's face it, you know, or a half of the cost, you know. So, yeah. yeah, buy the book first, obviously, um, <laughs> and then and then see see about the course. I completely agree. I think um, getting some navigation skills is really critical when you're going into the, the depths of Scotland. Um, navigation can be a little bit more tricky. And and if you've got if you've skilled yourself, then you can just enjoy it a little bit more, um, having that confidence. So yeah, I think I think getting skills is is really important. But getting out there and giving it a go is also important. There's just some places where you can do that with a bit more of a, a safety backup. If you're not sure where you are, but you're 10 minutes away from a town, it's it's a completely different picture. And if you're not sure where you are and you're in the middle of the Hebrides, you know, so acknowledge what level you're at and then build something that's appropriate to your level that, where you can go and try something out and, and practice. Um, but yeah, right. We, we are pretty much we are out of time. Um, so hopefully uh, that's inspired people. Um, I think it was I think it was a really interesting talk. Um, it's really nice, again, to see how the passion come out of you both. Um, and I think I think you can tell as soon as you open the book, it is beautiful. Uh, I feel like I do say that quite often because I am I am biased. But, you know, it is more beautiful than a standard Cicerone guidebook because the standard Cicerone guidebook is is supposed to just be practical and small. And we don't have the room to put in these enormous photographs. So, yeah, it feels like a really special book. I think it's beautiful. Well, well worth the money. Um, other places you can you can go to our website. You can order the book on there. You can also sign up to our newsletter on there. There's over a thousand articles. There's other live events um, on our website. So, yeah, there's there's lots and lots of information on there. There's there's probably some stuff about backpacking in Scotland, written by some of our authors as well. Stefan, we might have to get you to do something on the history of Scotland because we didn't have time to really let rip on that. But I feel like there's there's stuff there to be uh, talked about thank you both and i hope everybody's enjoyed it and i hope to see you again next month uh, thanks very much i hope you enjoyed the latest episode of footnotes the cicerone podcast i'd love to know what you think or if there's anything you'd like us to cover in future episodes please email live at cicerone.co.uk or leave a review on your podcast platform you can follow or subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss new episodes or you can sign up to our newsletter for all our latest news, events and guidebooks. Visit cicerone.co.uk for further details. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, come and find us on our social channels. We're on all the main ones as at Cicerone Press. And we also have a Facebook group, Cicerone Connect, where you can meet and chat to other outdoor enthusiasts. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you soon.